Good to be here. We appreciate we'll let, uh, we'll dance around here for a little bit, let everybody get, get settled. Uh, but appreciate the opportunity to talk. And so we want to answer any questions you all have. I'm, I'm going to go over uh, kind of a little bit of the history and, and where we're at in the process. And, and then obviously I think most, of, if not all of you, got a letter from us here a little over a month ago uh, kind of laying out um, what the consequences are if we don't make uh, meaningful progress through the work group process here over the next five or six months. Um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit, and certainly again, want to want to answer questions. Um, you know, it was a look at the agenda, just kind of tell you where we're at in this process. Uh, obviously, I'm a chief engineer, and the next four speakers are attorneys. Um, and so that's kind of typical of this issue, and, and a few others that we're dealing with across the state as well. Um, but it looks like why don't we uh, kind of head in? So. A lot of this, a uh, year ago, I, I spoke to the House Water Committee about this issue, uh, and so a lot of this is, is if you saw that, uh, some slides were in there, uh, kind of updated where we're at today. Um, and just as we think about an overview of the, the issue in general, and again, we'll hit some of, some of these issues a little more deeply uh, as we move through, but again, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as we get into, into questions and, and try and, and answer as many as we can. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has a, a water rate with the 1957 priority date uh, for 14,632 acre feet from stream flow for recreational use on, on the refuge. Uh, upstream pumping by, primary, by junior users is depleting the stream flow that feeds that water rate, feeds the refuge, uh, and is thereby causing impairment. Uh, it was determined to be impaired officially in 2016, and uh, last year we updated that. I did a supplement on that impairment report to bring that up to, to 2020. Uh, what has, has sparked this current round is again last year, just almost just almost a year ago exactly, uh, February 10th of last year, we received a letter from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife asking that we secure their request to, the, the request to secure water. And really what that is, that's a term of art within the Appropriation Act of Kansas, because uh, it's really a two-step process when we get into an impairment situation Somebody says, a senior rec says, I think my water is being impaired. We want the chief engineer at the Visual Water Resources to investigate that, determine whether I am being impaired by junior users. Uh, and if that's really what happened in 2016. Uh, and they say, if that's the case, then they say, I want my water rights secured. That means I want you to, to take action administratively to reduce or shut off water use from those junior users so that I have uh, the water that I'm entitled to. So they did that in, uh, in February. Uh, we went through a lot of, of uh, discussions and action last year. Um, a lot of that, of course, uh, out, of, out of this area as well. And in October, uh, they sent us a letter saying, we don't want to have action in 2024, but we want uh, you to be a work group um, and, and see what progress we can make in lieu of administration in 24. So I want to hit on a couple of key things, how we think about this from the appropriation act standpoint. What's the state law say about this? How do we end up in this position from a water rights standpoint? Uh, and so, the, again, I think as most of you know, the Kansas Water Appropriation Act really governs what we're doing in this, in this space for water rights. Uh, and so it's, all that's in Kansas 882A, 707, and that's just kind of the organization of the statutes. Uh, but 707 says surface and groundwater state may be appropriated. So, in some states, uh, surface and groundwater are not administered together. Um, they kind of run under separate systems. And our system went into place in 1945, and from the very beginning, uh, we said we're going to administer both surface and ground uh, under a single system. And so that becomes important in this situation because obviously we've got a surface right, uh, the senior, and a number of groundwater rights that are junior. But they are administered under the same system. The second part, the date of the priority right, um, and not the type of purpose you use determines the right to use water at any time when the supply is insufficient. And so again, that really is, is critical because it, the, the law is very clear. It does not matter whether it's municipal, industrial, recreation, irrigation. None of that matters when we get into an impairment or an in, in administration situation. It is strictly the prior appropriation system, first in time, first in right. Very clear in the statute. And again, see, between persons having 
uh, not enough water for some time this first year. So how does that uh, apply here? Actually, the previous 706B says, it shall be unlawful for any person to prevent, by diversion or otherwise, any waters of the state from moving to a person having a prior right to use the same. So again, this goes back to, if there's not enough water to go around, the senior right gets it first. That's the, that's the basis of the prior appropriation system. And the statute says, it's illegal. If you're a junior right, if you hold a junior right, and you are essentially upstream, um, it's illegal for you to capture water, put it to use, that would have gone to the senior right and they have a right to use it. And then the, in that same section, the chief engineer or chief engineer's agent shall, as may be necessary, secure the water prior appropriation, take action. So it doesn't say, you know, that we, we may take action, we can think about it. It says we determine there's an impairment and we have a request to your water, it says the chief engineer shall take action. It said, this is one that, that has been uh, put to us from a, a in the litigation side, I'll talk to you about here in a minute, of a non-discretionary um, action here. So when we talk about how does that, how does the groundwater pumping or groundwater use impact stream flow or impact in a way impair a senior downstream right? And so we've kind of got a, a series of, of slides, and, and again, I think this is uh, applicable here because really what we have at the top is, is a situation where you, you know, prior to pumping, where you had groundwater that was, was flowing into the stream. So you think about, you know, seeps or springs or those kind of things that are coming out of the ground and going into the stream. As we put in wells and start to create that coated depression, we bring that water level down. <coughs> Excuse me. We bring that water level down and we start to uh, have less water flowing from the groundwater into the into the stream. And then ultimately we, we break that connection between the groundwater and surface water. So this goes back to that previous where it says if you're a junior right holder, that water has been moving from the groundwater into the surface water to the senior right holder. If you're capturing that and preventing that water from moving to the senior right holder, that's when we are uh, out of compliance with the statute. So if we look, at, okay, this one. so if we look at the, the difference again, when when this Corvira from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife applied for their right in 1957, and again that's what sets the date is when the application to develop a water right. Got into the office of the chief engineer. There were 60 other water rights within Zone A. Uh, now there's now there's a little over 1,400. Again, I'll tell you all something you haven't seen before, and, and I think many of you've seen this map, or most of you've seen this map. Uh, and the, the map is is kind of a heat map that shows from the from the GMB5 blue groundwater model how much of the water that is pumped would have made it into the stream at Zenith if it had not been pumped. Right, so if we look at the, the higher areas, and it's kind of probably hard to see the ledge down here, but it goes from anywhere from just really nothing, one or two percent, clear up to 80 or 90 percent. So again, if you pump 100 acre feet in that very closest area, 80 or 90 of that uh, acre feet of that pumpage would have been in the stream, would have been in the gauge, and available for the season. So if we look at the zenith gauge, the top line, is called a stream flow exceedance. And so we think about on the left side, how often we get a, a, a flow that's that big. And so at the very upper end, how often we get a thousand CFS flow by zenith? Very, very rarely. And if we come over on the right side, where it's 100%, basically all the time, in 1974 through 83, that period, we had at least one, and you can see half the time we were probably in about 70 CFS. Over time, as you see, that kind of moves down in, in tenure increments, we see the stream flow coming down. To the last portion where, again, if we look at about that midpoint, instead of 60 or 70 CFS at Zenith, on average, we're down about 10. So that's how much Actions upstream, whether that's pumping or, or whatever, have 
change the stream flow at the zenith gauge. Right? When we talk about depletions of flow at the, at the zenith gauge or into uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we're really talking about that change over time. Right? How much water was there at one time, certainly in, at, at the time that right was established, versus how much we see now. So if we think about the history, again, uh, August 15, 1957, uh, priority date when the application was received. Uh, 1980s was when U.S. Fish and Wildlife first started expressing concern to Division Water Resources about the stream flow being depleted or going down. In the early 90s, 1994, we officially formed a partnership between DWR, GMD, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Water Pack to work on this issue. Uh, so we're on our, our 30th anniversary of being officially uh, working together on this issue. In 1996, the chief engineer at the time, David Pope, certified the water right and kept 14,632 acre feet. It's important to, to note that in 1957, the application was for 22,000 acre feet. So the right was certified for uh, a little over 7,000 acre feet less than the application was for uh, originally. 2000, the partnership uh, signed an agreement, a 12 year agreement to do a number of things. Uh, we talk about a number of, of very similar things, whether that's purchasing water rights, water conservation, the water bank came out of that management program. Uh, augmentation was contemplated at that time. Uh, there was an enhanced compliance and enforcement. Uh, and there was four year time frames in which the, the review was done on that, that management plan. Uh, and in 2012, there was the end of that. There was a goal of about 27,000 acre feet of savings in that management plan. And after the 12 years, we had gotten just over 10% of that accomplished. Uh, there was a, a, an ex expectation that if we didn't reach the goal in that 12 year period, that there would be a request for IGUCA in 2013, which did not happen for, for any number of reasons. But that really is what led U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and again, I'm not speaking for the month, this is my, uh, my understanding and my belief of how things happened or progressed. 2013, that's when U.S. Fish and Wildlife said, this approach isn't really working. We want the, the Chief Engineer of Visual Resources to, to evaluate them through the formal process and make a determination of whether or not our water right is legally being impaired. So that started that process. In the middle of that 2015, the legislature modified the Appropriation Act to allow augmentation to be a part of that solution. Uh, again, that's what we supported at the time, it's still support today. And in July 15th of 2016, the impairment report was finalized that we talked about quite a bit, showing that the senior is being impaired. So we talk about what does impairment mean in this situation? And I want to caution, we, we try and make sure that if we're going to uh, set an impairment standard up, we can apply it, we're, we're going to think back, it's the priority of the water right, not the type of use that matters. And so we're going to be thinking about how do we create an evaluation that we can apply to any type of use uh, or any water right, regardless of whether it's, in this case, U.S. Fish and Wildlife or Recreation Right or something else. So each water right has a certain uh, beneficial use that it's authorized for. Um, and in general, it's not. We want to make sure that people are being conservative, that they are using water reasonably, that they are using it for a beneficial purposes required by law. But we don't want to get into a position of saying, we, we're going to tell you how to operate your water right. right? If we do that, then we got to do that for every single water right across the state. But as part of the evaluation, we went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife and said, tell us about how you need to use water on the refuge to meet your purpose and for which the, the water right was established. And so they had given us uh, a demand pattern of kind of when they need water to serve the purposes of the, of the refuge. So first thing we look at is say, is the gauge flow at zenith, because that's our, our closest measuring point that's measured by US uh, GS, so an independent uh, entity, is that gauge flow bigger than what the refuge need is for that period, whether it's July or October. And again, their demand pattern varies throughout the year. Uh, if they need more water in the spring or in the fall, they have migration patterns, uh, less in the winter and summer. So is that gauge flow more than the refuge needs? 
If it, if it is, then there's no impairment. If it's not, then we've got to go down and say, what does the model tell us about the form that would have been there had junior pumping not been impacting stream flow? Now, if we say, is the gauge flow plus the, the amount that's been depleted bigger than refuge needs? If the answer is yes, it's impaired, and the difference is the refuge needs minus the gauge flow. And if no, the impairment equals the depletions. And so a change that we made, a couple changes we made is the supplement, uh, as we updated from 2016 to last year, was to not only look at these, but we also said, recognizing, and again, feedback we heard uh, after 2016, there's times when maybe the impairment, you just look, kind of look through that flow chart, you might say there's an impairment, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife historically didn't divert water during that time, even if there was water available. If there's any number of reasons, maybe, again, maybe they already had water on the property, maybe they were in some maintenance issue, and so we worked uh, to try and identify a method to say, how much of that can we say they don't need water? Again, trying to quantify uh, the impairment. And it did, it did reduce the impairment uh, uh, frequency and size somewhat. Not significantly, but it was, it was 15%, give or take. The other thing was, I uh, wanted to make sure that we included the evaporation from Wilson Marsh as part of, the, of their water usage, as we thought about how much demand they had that had not been met. Again, we're looking from a historic period where we think about impairment, uh, not so much a new perspective piece. We, but when the certificate was calculated, the evaporation from the Wool Salt Marsh was part of that calculation of how much water they had used. And so we wanted to make sure and capture that as part of the impairment. Again, uh, that reduced the frequency and size of the impairment uh, somewhat. But if we look at that again, and again using the model, using that, that process I just talked about with the, the updates, um, we see that it still shows uh, unsurprisingly, uh, an impairment that's that's fairly frequent and, and in some ways fairly sizable. So, um, so 2017 again. Now 26. We're back to 2016. Um, the impairment report has been uh, finalized. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife files our first request to secure water. Uh, our rules and regulations. Uh, say that if we're in the middle of an impairment discussion, we're in the middle of uh, uh, something that covers a, a sizable area within a GMD, we're going to go talk to the GMD and, and consult with them on how we solve that issue. Uh, so we started that 20, late 2017, uh, primarily focusing on a local enhanced management area, which again was a, a tool that's about five years old then. Uh, worked on that for a couple of years. U.S. Fish and Wildlife again filed a request to water in, in 2018. Uh, in February 2019, uh, Lima plan was submitted by GMB 5. Uh, in July of that year, it was determined that it did not meet the statutory requirements of Lima uh, in order to solve the under underlying impairment issue. And of course, many of you remember that's where, where we were at uh, three and a half years ago in this very same room. Well, I wasn't in this room, but many of you were in the same room at that time talking about the administration plan um, in September of that year. Um, in July of that year, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and GB5 entered into an MOU. Uh, they did a number of things, but primarily U.S. Fish and Wildlife agreed not to file requests to secure water in 2020 or 2021. GB5 agreed to pursue augmentation as well as retirement of some water rights and conservation measures. Um, in January, following that uh, agreement, Audubon of Kansas filed suit against the Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, Secretary of Agriculture in the state of Kansas, and uh, the Chief Engineer for lack of action on the impairment in federal court. So ultimately, we were dismissed, the state, the Secretary of Agriculture and, and the Chief Engineer were dismissed in that lawsuit because our argument was that this is a state, we were, we were acting under a state statute should be dealt with in state court, not in federal court. Uh, Federal agencies were essentially dismissed because 
Audubon was arguing that they had finalized action and had not protected their water right. And the court basically said, no, there was no final agency action. Let me give you the attorneys can explain this better than I can, but you have to have a final, a final federal agency action in order for a group like Audubon, in order for them to sue and be successful against a federal agency. We would argue, and I'll come back to this in a second, uh, they don't have standing to, to bring suit against us under state law. Uh, in 2021, Jimmy Five received uh, NRCS grant that I think is now learning probably uh, closer to about a million dollars at this point, right? To work on the investments. I know Amy, I think, is going to talk about the EIS process and, and where that's at. And that's really what that, that, that watershed program and evaluation of options, uh, that's really where that's tied up. Uh, and then, of course, this recent action. So, again, February 10th of last year. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife filed a request to secure water uh, with our office, uh, asking for immediate action in 23. Uh, we told them uh, very shortly after that that we were not going to take action because we need to update the impairment report, uh, we need to re redefine the administrative action, and that we were not going to take action in 23, but we were going to develop a plan for action in 24. Uh, based on that fact, and again, Many of you received, many or all of you received a letter from me uh, in April last year that kind of said that, right? Here's, here's where we stand today. Uh, in June of last year, Audubon went to the Kansas Supreme Court and then back to district court uh, saying that we were not asking for uh, immediate action for the, for the uh, court to direct uh, DWR to take action because we were, we were not taking action as required by the Kansas Water Appropriation Act. Uh, they they pulled that action back. Um, we we and they agreed voluntarily to, to dismiss that action in October after U.S. Fish and Wildlife had sent a letter in October 10th uh, saying we don't want action in 24. We want a work group um, moving forward. We convened that work group in January, and then again January 25th sent you all a letter uh, kind of laying out what would happen in 25 if we're not successful in, in other alternatives uh, in the short term period. Uh, so, so what does that mean? Again, we'll come back to the work group and where we're at here in just a minute. But what does it mean when we talk about an administration plan? Um, individual allocations based on the appropriate quantity, not past historic use, based on priority, and based on that impact that, that heat map I talked about a little bit earlier. So um, we look at trying to make sure first and foremost that we uh, stop any further depletions and we start recovering the system, but this does not secure this, the fish and wildlife's full right in the short term, right? We're talking many years to, to recover at this rate. And we had a balancing act uh, we've got a calculator that looks at saying, okay, how much water do we need to, to restore to the system or, or how much water can we allow to be pumped uh, out of these areas in order to meet that overall goal of starting to turn the system around and, and see some recovery over the long term. And then we have the question of, do we base that solely on first in time, first in right? Because we have certainly a number of folks that say, the law is very clear. When you've got an impairment, you've got to cross your water, you start with the most junior right, you shut them off, and you work your way down. And if you're in a stream system, a sole stream system, not a groundwater surface, that makes, that's really easy to do. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, but when we get into the situation that we're talking about with, with only a portion of the pumping that you, whatever you pump, would have been in the stream, does it make sense to completely shut off somebody that's out of the 10% zone that may have a junior right and not shut somebody off at all, it's in a 70 or 80 percent zone. Likewise, we had folks that, that said, we should just focus on the people that are in that highest impact zone. That'll be the least people that we can address, we'll have the highest impact, we'll recover the quickest. We don't believe that that's fully in line with the appropriation, right? Because we do have to recognize priority. And so ultimately we said we're gonna balance that. We're gonna wait how we figure that allocation basically 
Right? We're going to base 50% of the allocation calculation on the priority. We're going to base 50% of it on what we call proximity, but it's really the impact to the street. So that's kind of how, if you got letters, that's kind of the, the, the spreadsheet, the calculation was going on in the background that led to that, that number. We talked about, we moved away from the heat map a little bit on the impact as we started thinking about flexibility. Because certainly we've said, we, as we talked to folks, um, you know, there were folks say, you know, if I get some flexibility, either have a, a five-year allocation, if I have some flexibility to move water, if I've got maybe two or three pivots and I can rotate around or something like that, then that'll be helpful. So we said, okay, let's see if there's a way for us to do that. The tiers, tier one, two, and three, are the, the amount of flexibility of what was appropriate based on the timing of the impact. So when we think about the closest tier, that tier one, we didn't allow really much of any flexibility other than being able to combine some allocations uh, because we knew whatever pumping happened this year was gonna impact the stream this year. And if we think about it from the time that we're gonna have the biggest impact on the impairment or have the biggest impairment, we wanna make sure that those are also gonna be pretty dry years. Those will be years that folks are gonna wanna pump more uh, and that's not a great answer, but we believe that making sure that we don't stack a bunch of pumping in a single year when we're having a big impact on impairment, that's our best way to, to try and move us forward and try and work our way out of this. We move out to tier two. Again, we get uh, a little bit beyond that. Maybe the pumping this year doesn't necessarily impact it this year, depending on when you're pumping within the year. So maybe you can have a five-year allocation. So maybe you can pump you know, up to your full authorized quantity, and you can spread that allocation out uh, over five years. We get further out, we say some of the tools like MIFAs, safe deposit accounts that allow you in a dry year to go beyond your authorized quantity, uh, as long as we're staying within our five-year allocation. Again, we've got to bring up the overall usage down and we're bringing things back in balance. That gives some flexibility to try and address the drought year but we think that the impacts of the stream are going to be spread out because we're getting further and further away from the stream. And so our lag effects of that pumping, uh, we believe, are, are able to, to be absorbed a little bit within the noise of the system. We said we will allow uh, moving of, of allocations uh, as long as we're moving it within a tier or moving from a, uh, a tier that's closer to the stream to one that's further away. So we want to try and move, what can you move water away from the stream out of those higher impact zones. So we can, we can combine allocations, we can move allocations as long as we don't move it closer to the stream or to a higher impact zone, right? We want to, again, try and, try and recover over time. Uh, and again, I mentioned, uh, this is a long-term recovery plan, right? This doesn't mean that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife water right. If we implemented this today, this doesn't mean the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's full water right impairment is resolved in 24, 25. But we, got it. it's, we look at this from the standpoint of, we got into this over a number of years, it's gonna take a number of years to get out of it. Uh, this conversation we've had with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, I, will, I will say um, they have been, I think, very open to a lot of these discussions um, and, and are very workable. We can talk about what that means as we go along. Um, so I might, the only other thing I think we had on the, the agenda uh, was the Wet Creek uh, Aguco evaluation. Um, and I know we talk about that all the time. We did, um, um, we had paused it as, as blue was upgraded groundwater model. And so we, we have that now. Uh, can't tell you exactly what's in it because Chris is, is the one that's leading that effort. Uh, and I'm going to be the hearing officer at some point. So you can't tell me what it says yet. But it tells me it's here about another month or so. Uh, we should have. Uh, a draft report and can move into more of the public hearing and you all can see what what the findings are and come and tell us whether we got it right or not. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to, to share with you um, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you have. What, what's the effect of, or what input thought did you put in for climate change? I mean I'm, I'm a pilot and I've flown over for years 30 years or more out west, and there's a lot of 
streams that are not flowing, the Arkansas is one out there that used to ice fly over all the time. There's a lot of water in there. There's nothing that coming out of Colorado. That, so my question is, for, are you, you taking it into the, the, the natural ring that comes out of the sky that goes directly into the creek now? Well, only to the extent that we look at what would have been there had, um, you know, has been. All of our impairment evaluation has to be kind of a retrospective look, by definition, right? Because because things could change, and you know this this year could be uh, less of a lot of rainfall, and the next ten years could be. But if you look at the trending, the trending over 20, 30 years, what's the total rainfall over those thirty? Yeah, years? And, and when we look at the total rainfall in this area, it's actually gone up a little bit. Uh, not a lot, but a little bit. The trend in South Central Kansas is actually up a little bit. Um, but so our, our action here, and, and again, I think this is this is critical, is the action that we have the ability to take when we talk about water rights is only the action on water rights, right? So things that may uh, soil moisture practices or, or terraces and ponds and, and all those things are really outside the purview of the statute that we have an ability to deal with. Um, and so we've got to take the, the information we have as it stands today, and, and I think that's where the modeling comes in. Now, the modeling can be helpful um, as, as we think about something like that. If what does that mean for the future, right? And what are we, what are we going to be planning for in future actions so that we're hopefully not in a situation where we're being reactive completely but are, are communicating well. But from an impairment standpoint, we've got to deal with this, the data and the information we have as it exists today and what has happened to us to get to this point. Hey Earl, um, where you said we can move water from tier one to tier two to tier three, Correct. is anywhere in there going to meet safe yield if we do that? And if you determine we can move it outside of tier three to outside of this, with the other guys in Yeah, I, um, so I mean, I think you know, the impairment section would still exist between users, right? Um, and so we would think of these allocation transfers as a temporary action. Um, and so, you know, we think about safe yield being an evaluation of either a new application or a change application is going to be a permanent change. Now, if somebody stacked a bunch and said, we want to stack a bunch of water right on, or a bunch of water on one water right, I think we would have to look at that pretty carefully and make sure we're not impairing somebody else in that local neighborhood. Um, but we would, you know, we want to try and be flexible with that as well. And, you know, all the feedback we've, I shouldn't say all, but the majority of the feedback we've gotten is really folks are saying, you know, I don't know what anybody's numbers say, but let's say you had three three wells, they all had six inches, right? And say, I, I want to rotate them around, I want to put 12 on one and six on the other one and go dry land on one. How do we do that, right? How do we how do we make that the most useful? But but I think if we got to be too big of a, a hit in one spot, I think we'd have to look at that and, and, and be very careful about not screwing that area up. But, and we haven't really thought about moving outside, but I think we would support moving outside here Three as well, yeah. Uh, my name is Blake Hemelright. This is my uh, tenant. He also farms down uh, in Pratt County. Uh, we're in the area, I think, tier three is the outer one, right? Correct. Okay, so we're in, I'm actually on the boundary with two boundaries on, on each side of my property. We have 272 acre water rights. And in looking at the sheet that describes where priority date of uh, 1968 or number 100. Um, and we're going to lose 37% of our water right. Okay? We're in the Nisgah Basin. We're not upstream. We're not even in the same stream. We're in a different watershed. And so I wonder about this model, and especially I think about the guy that's 600 feet to the east of me that's not going to lose any water. So you have this absolutely capricious boundary that's in a different watershed. And we lose 37% of our right. And we're a very senior water right. And you take into consideration that there are 1,300 water rights approximately affected. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm looking at this thing and thinking, how on earth could you determine that kind of effect for us, which is a very adverse economic impact for us. But how could you determine what's going on underground to that degree 
that that guy to the east of me has no impact at all for him, and I lose 37% of my water bill. So I'll give you kind of a two-part answer to that. Um, first of all, all the, all the calculations, uh, whether you're in or not, are based on the groundwater model and what it says is going to be the impact of pumping. Whether you're in, in this, we have the same question on the other side, on the ARP side as well. Um, why is my pumping? I'm not in the Rattlesnake Creek watershed, but my pumping is going to impact the stream, right? That's really what the that's what the groundwater model uh, tells us is happening. Uh, now, the other part of where you're at on on that line, uh, I, it, it's one of those. Frankly, no matter where you draw the line, somebody's going to be on the wrong side of it. Along the lines of what he said, this fellow over here to do the climate change. Mm -hmm. Now. If we don't satisfy the uh, Quivera and the Federal Wildlife Service, are you just going to keep moving that line east until you get what you need? And you're just going to start cutting rights and keep going east or keep going west until you get what you need? Well, I, I, I would always say that the line would move if a further evaluation of the model says that, that the situation has changed. The, the, the aquifer situation has changed. And, and the line really is, where is there at least a 10% impact on the stream flow uh, versus where is there not? Um, now, I could, I could see a situation where the climate change or something else where we say, okay, you know, overall, 37% versus your water right, um, it's about an average, we look at the entire usage, not the entire water rights, but the entire usage is about a 30% uh, we're allocation is about 30% less than the overall average usage. And so that certainly could be something we would have to look at in the future if we're not seeing um, enough success to say, is that enough? Just, just a point, and it's not really a question, but it seems like the, um, the solution that you have in your model, and the way that you propose taking, um, cutting back water rights or cutting back our appropriations seems overly democratic. And if you have said that, I mean, there's no question that the issue of the priority date it seems to be overarching. And yet it doesn't seem like the priority date is being given the significance of the primacy that it should in this situation. And, and again, I, I appreciate that. Ultimately, that has to be, I mean, we can, we can move that discussion one way or the other. Um, and, but but at, so, at some point we had to say we, we're going to make a judgment call on what we think is both uh, effective and legally defensible, and that's that's kind of where we landed. And again, um, there's going to be folks that are on the other side that say it did it wrong the other way. We we understand that. We're certainly open to criticism and, and comment on that um, and, and feedback. If everybody agrees we did it wrong, we need to do it a different way. Then then I think we would be open to that discussion. But we had to start somewhere to make a decision. Thank you. Yeah. It looks to me like that you have uh, the state over appropriating the whole area that got 1,600 wells. Um, why? And they had this MDS, or the minimum desirable stream flow wells. Why were those not challenged at the time that the impairment started happening? Why was that not taken place? Well, I think, so um, again, kind of a two part answer. So when the impairment started happening, right, when there was definition of impairment, I think. Um, I don't think if Tom or, or Daryl, it's 92 or 93 when the district was closed, or 95, I'm trying to get some of history, so, you know, sometime in the mid-90s, right, the, the district was closed, so no additional water right development at that point. Um, so, I'm going to back up even just a little bit further here, right? Uh, so the Appropriation Act went into place in 1945, but from 1945 until uh, 1978, there was no requirement that you get a permit to, to divert water or pump from the chief engineer before you started to do so. Um, and the, the Groundwater Management District Act passed in 1972, so really in the, in the 70s we, we started seeing a lot of discussion at the state level and, and locally too about the need to put in additional controls and that kind of happened, the, the authority for that kind of happened over the, that 10 year period. So we still had additional development, and I didn't, didn't have it here, but if we look at 
when the majority of these wells went in, and again, if you know this, most of them went in kind of in that early 70s to early 80 period, right? So it just ramped up. If you look, if we do a graph, that 70s, it just kind of goes along and just takes off. And so there was, there was kind of a time period where people were starting to realize that maybe, you know, kind of unfettered development uh, and water rights was not such a great idea from a state policy standpoint. But we really didn't put, it, put a, a legal mechanism in place to, to start really putting that into place until 78. And then had kind of built the, and then the MDS went into place in 1980. 84, sorry, thank you, uh, April of 1984. And so we still had some development after that. There's not, there are some wells that are, are after that, there's not a tremendous amount. And if we look at it again, looking at it from the model, you say, how many of those MDS wells are having a significant impact on the stream? We get to a smaller number. But we certainly do think that addressing the MDS wells as part of this, we, you know, we don't look at the allocation, but we, we think we need to address it as part of this overall discussion. What percentage in the cuts that you've listed on the letters that, or the list that we got, how many of those cuts are in the S-Wells? Yeah, Jeff, do you know? I mean, there's, I'm trying to remember how many there's. Jeff's hiding now. There you are, Jeff. Uh, and, how many of these walls in, in Zone A? Yeah, it was about that. Uh, 100, a little, little 100, over 100, and, 100 to 120, I can't remember the exact number. So it would be less than 10% of the wells are, are after 1984. And again, if we look at those areas that are really close to the stream, we get to, we're getting down about 25 or 30 of them. Um, so it's just, it's partially how the, how the, the legal system and the politics developed over time, as well at the same time how the base developed. And, and, there is some overlap, and again, we want to, we're, going to, we're going to talk about how do we uh, address the MDS as part of that, but, but it is not a significant game changer. You can't just say, we're going to shut off all the MDS wells, and we're going to, that's going to deal with it, because it doesn't have as big an impact because of when the banks are built. That makes sense. Yeah, if, uh, if everybody works together and we do water leasing, we move water rights, we buy water rights, all that, and earlier you said, Shows progress. Mm -hmm. What is clearly defined progress going to look like? I mean, if everybody spends millions of dollars and we get the ball rolling, if we get 15 or 20 wells leased or moved, what's progress look like to you? And you're not saying that ain't going to work or it's going to work. I mean, we kind of need a number yeah. to hit so we know what we're doing. Right. And I, I, thanks for bringing that up, please, because I, I promised I'd talk about kind of the work group and then kind of got sidetracked and never came back around to that. Um, you know, that was part of the other deal that we had with U.S. Fish and Wildlife was to say, okay, um, and obviously there was some politics that went involved in that, um, and said, let's put a work group together, and, and certainly we've kind of got a lot of the ag groups, we've got Water Pack, we've got the GMD, um, we've got a number of folks involved trying to identify what are some things we can do in the short term, recognizing that um, the, the GMD is working through the EIS process on, on some bigger uh, Big, bigger solutions, primarily federally funded. Uh, and so there are options on the table that folks have brought, whether that's, that's leasing, buying out water rights, maybe a pilot augmentation project, a number of things. We just had our first meeting in, in January. We're going to have another meeting here at the end of next week um, with the goal of, you know, by the middle, middle of the year, we'll know whether or not um, we have met enough of their criteria. Now, I'm kind of dancing around because you're saying, we need the number. I don't have a number for you today, right? Um, and, and again, I, I'd go back and say, all of our discussions with U.S. Fish and Wildlife in the last six months to a year um, have been, I, I think, very constructive. Um, I think they've been very workable, and I think those of you that have been able to talk to them in some of these meetings, hope you would, you would say the same thing. But they're trying to evaluate that as well, right? I mean, frankly, it's a little bit of an ongoing negotiation. If, if I were, and I'm not, again, I'm not speaking for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but if I were U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I'd be saying, how much, how much gain can I get before I say, okay, it's good enough? And you're saying, how little do I have to do before it's good enough? We're trying to figure out where that crossover point is. Uh, I think we're making progress. We don't have that today. So, but I think it's a combination of all those things, right? I think we've got to bring the overall usage down some. We've got to think about how do we get some immediate action, whether that's a powered augmentation project and put wet water in the stream, 
And, and again, the, the thing I, I, I think many of you know, but I, I didn't touch on is, um, you know, there was funding bill, a state water plan fund funding bill passed last year that added another $18 million to the water plan fund each year. Um, and in the current fiscal year, dedicated $7 million to that to Rattlesnake Creek. Um, and so we've got some state funds, uh, and the governor was very supportive of that. Um, backed it up and, and got that through the State Finance Council. Um, so we've got some state funds to try and implement some of those, but we've got to figure out what's the best, what, what's the biggest bang for our buck? And is there other funds we can leverage to try and take that $7 million and turn it into 10 or 14 or whatever uh, and move that down the, down the path a little bit? So without that number, what do you define as square progress? Well, To, to some degree, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to put a number on it, but I think from, from my own personal belief, we had a number of different entities um, sitting around the table and having, I would say, very open, constructive, face-to-face -face conversations probably with, with a number of those players for the first time maybe ever, right? Um, I think there's been plenty of times where we've had two or three of those folks together, but then we don't have necessarily some of the folks that are uh, can make things happen either in the state house or in, or in D.C. that can make some of those federal dollars or, or state dollars happen, uh, or if there's state uh, policy changes we make. Some of those folks are, are really at the table for the first time. Um, and I think, again, I, I, I'll say, you know, I, I first got involved in this issue in 1993. Um, and so, you know, it's just... I've been it every day like many of you have, but but to me, there, we've had more people more directly engaged trying to find short and long-term solutions, um, that, and, and a lot of people that have the ability to try and make things happen more so than we've ever had. Now, trying to put, take that and say, is that good enough? Well, we've got to have something substantive at the end of that, but but I think there's some, there's some value in, uh, in that partnership and keeping that going past this year as well. Was the Zenith gauge in existence in 1957? And if it was, what was the stream flow then? 73. 73? Yeah. So if I went back to... <coughs> so that, that top line really is kind of where that stream flow was at, you know, in that, in that 74 to 83 time frame, right? Um, and so, again, if we look at what's the average flow at that time, 50% of the time, it was 60 to 70 cubic feet per second. And now we're, we're about 10. Um, I did take out one. I probably should have left it in now because you had a question. There, we have one from Maxwell that goes back further because Maxwell gauge goes back further. has the same pattern, right? We had more flow uh, back in the, in the 50s and 60s than we do now, obviously. Um, and so I, that's, that's, does that answer your question? Because it's, it's, that's kind of where we're at. Again, we can, the, the top end's not that much different, and the bottom end obviously is not that much different, but it's kind of that middle flow of, of what you normally see kind of on an average day has gone down by from 60 or 70 down to about 10. No. I appreciate you coming out, First of all, I appreciate you coming out. Uh, I don't have your job. <laughs> uh, and I've been working on as a partnership since I came back from college in about 93. We had a quarter of ground, a corner from us. The hottest market in the land is recreational hunting. And this quarter of ground used to be farmed. Today it's all grown with cottonwoods and uh, salt cedar. And there's a uh, kind of mystery stream flow that usually flows through there when it rains, and we haven't had any runoff from that. Do the models account for the growth in? Uh, you, you are, and the model does have uh, a factor in it that, that tries to account for the free adipites. Now, I don't remember, I don't know if I know offhand, if, if that number went up over time, um, or if it's just kind of what the best estimate of where that is at today. What but it does include where we think it's at today. What is their contribution to the solution? Well, 
uh, again, I think there, there's certainly, and I know uh, Nature Conservancy and, and others have been working on trying, moving kind of upstream from Quivira to try and, and take some of those graphites out. Uh, so we certainly think that uh, can be part of the solution. Again, that's really, from, a, from an impairment standpoint, that's really outside of our, our ability to kind of order that or require that. But we certainly, as that happens, um, and we see a change in the stream flow that we can recognize that and make adjustments to how we're addressing the rest of the system. I don't know if that's a, that's a great answer, that's probably the best because I can do right now. Yeah. If I'm not correct, the Fifth Amendment, if your rights are confiscated by a government agency, you need to be compensated. How are you going to compensate us? So I would. I'll give you my uh, engineering attorney answer, and I can let the, the attorneys that actually have law degrees follow up. But your right is not being taken, right? You have a right to use water when it's available in priority, right? You don't have an absolute right to, to water. You have a right to use water so long as it's available and a senior, another senior user with a defined right doesn't need it. And so rights are not being taken. Rights are being managed within the prior appropriation system. All, all of my land is in the micro program right now. And I'm in the high impact zone. And I understand that the micros are not going to be in place. So I spent a lot of money to get that into the micro. Uh, did some repairs to the systems, took hand guns off, you know, the fees. Now, how are we, will I be compensated for that? No. Are there other questions? Thank you. I don't want to touch on Lance's deal here. Um, is there a chance with the uh, potential purchase leasing the water that, that our state is, what well, once you heard, really open to funding a lot of that? Well, I think the question of what's a lot of that is open to interpretation, right? I, certainly what I've heard from the governor's office so far is they're okay with, I mean, you know, we get $18 million additional money and $7 million that comes to this one part of the state. Uh, they, they, the message I got from the person is that this is a, this is a one-time investment. Now, uh, we've also told them that means you all are going to go back to your representative and say, we need more money, and that's, that's what you, your right is. You ought to be doing that. I don't know what the political appetite for that's going to be going forward, to be honest with you. Uh, I know there's some money sitting there, but uh, is there going to be another $7 million? I can tell you. <laughs> um, out west, they have the CRDP program for retiring water rights. Correct. And I understand from Steve Frost that some of the land within this area is eligible for that, right? Correct. It is. Okay, but not all of it. Well, is that, well, to what extent is it available? Yeah, I, I don't We have to give them, I don't know the map. Uh, it seem that, you know, it's a rather attractive alternative, yeah. especially out west where, you know, you've got to climb a water table, but yeah. it's not a bad idea for this thing, too. Uh, we, I agree. Now, we support the crap, and, and I just I don't know. Do you know? You said CRP, right? CRP, crap. Yeah, correct, too. Okay. Yeah. Like, for sure on that, but uh, I'm just wondering if there's a
per acre of a particular row crop. I'm not sure we're on the same page because the yeah. CREP out west, you retire your water rights voluntarily. Correct. You get payments for 15 years. Correct. There's even an upfront bonus. Correct. Is that what you're talking about? I am. That, yeah. that CREP, I, the, the CREP program I do not manage. I just manage the EQIP program. Okay. So I have a lesser incentive right. than, than CREP does because, and I, and I don't re require you to retire rights for 15 years. Yeah, the equip is like a three to five year. It's five. Five year. Three, it used to be three, but as of 2022, yeah. 2023, and 2024, it's up to five years. Yeah, so it's, it's more of a lease. You can drive in farm within the five years, and you're paying your water right. You can go back to you know whatever your water ratio was at that five year period under equip, right? Now the CREP program, I apologize, I should have known. We'll, we'll make sure that the. the Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. I'm at the field office as well. Okay. The other thing I will, I will add on that, I know, uh, you know, one of the, the things that's been a hold up for a lot of folks, um, not only here, but in, in other parts of the West, is, you know, it's a, it's a CRP program. And so historically, it's been convert that property to grass at least for a 15 year period, right? So you're not driving and farming. Um, there was provision in the last farm bill that was actually put in with, uh, by Senator Roberts um, to allow dry land farming for CREP, obviously a reduced real payment. Um, and Colorado has been able, and Northeast Colorado has been able to um, get that provision put in place. We're trying, Steve Frost and, and, and Fish and Conservation is, is working with FSA to try and get that dry land farming provision as an option in Kansas as well, right? So. You wouldn't necessarily, you know, you would get a less lesser rental payment because you get the difference, I think, uh, between irrigated and dry land rental rates. Uh, but you'd still be able to drive and farm that during that period. But that's still in the works, and I know, actually, you know, I know uh, FSC director Dennis McKinney's working on that as well. So. Other questions? Yeah. Who ultimately uh, makes the call for water, that type of thing? And does the buck stop with the head of the Department of Interior? How does this, you know, whole thing, you know, I guess who, who makes that determination? We were talking about, you know, how yeah. do we solve this? Who, whose determination is that? Well, yeah, that's really within Department of Interior. When, when I got a letter last uh, February, it was from the regional director, right? Uh, now, then the national director and the Secretary of Interior get involved when it gets to be political. Uh, but I would expect if we're going to see a letter of determination, it's going to come out of Denver and, and the regional director. That's, but again, it could change. That's my expectation. Other questions? Yeah. If the DA is in the high impact zone, all went to the Europe hypothetically, would that accomplish the same thing as, as the administration that you have to well, if, you, if you get enough of them, yeah. I mean, we, it'd be one of those, if we, It'd be an alternative if you want to say, okay, what does that look like? We could we could certainly run the model and say, how does that, what, how does that impact? Uh, not not that I don't think we've done that directly that way. No, no, but we certainly we could do that. Yeah, I know we've kind of looked at kind of shutting off all the folks in the in the close area, um, but again, that's where we think we get kind of out of balance with the priority and and probably would lose on a lawsuit pretty quickly. This uh, seven million dollars you keep talking about, like, is it your work group that decides how that is is spent, and then you know, or do you have goals or priorities on, you know, or is it for augmentation, legislation, trying to get people to the table? What what's your direction? Yeah, so um, you know, all of that is within the Department of Agriculture. Uh, it's either within our we got visual water resources and conservation, so it's it's within that. Uh, that purview. You know, we will certainly, ultimately, somebody within the Department of Agriculture is going to have to sign a contract or write a check, right? Sure. So that's going to be the ultimate decision. But we're certainly going to, um, you know, want to want to work with the work group to make sure that it's going to be the most effective solution we can, and it's going to be supported by other folks, especially if we need to go either get more money from somewhere else or more money in order to make that happen. Go make sure we got support for that to do that. So um, it, ultimately, it's. Somebody in Ag is going to make that decision, but we want to coordinate with workers to do it. So don't have really a direction yet on what 
Now, certainly, I mean, you know, the things we've talked about um, are either you know buying water rights, leasing water rights, um, kind of in combination with the water conservation area. Um, we've talked about a pilot augmentation project. Um, you know, the other thing that the portion that is, is sitting within Division of Water Resources, um, and again, not to prejudge the, where the, the EIS process is at, um, and whether or not a, a, a larger augmentation project is, is the right answer, but we have a pretty good idea of, of the area that we're talking about, and we want to try and use some of that money to, to get ready, and you know, uh, so if, if and when they file applications, that we can move those through as quickly as possible, right? Because last thing I want to do is to go through the yes process, which lasts two or three or four years, whatever it's going to be now. Um, they come back and file the applications and say, okay, now we're ready to go. And we say, great, now we're going to do some more work. It's going to take another two years. We want to, we want to be ready. So we want to take some of that money and, and make sure that we can be as helpful in that permitting process as, as we can. I don't think it's going to take a lot of money, but I, again, I want to be open that that's really a big part of it to, to speed that process along. I think we'll, we will want to talk about a pilot hog project, uh, and then I think the other is, is again, what's the balance of purchasing versus lease. But, but again, we, we've got to get figure out where, where people are willing to participate, right? Um, that side of it is all voluntary, so people got to say, yeah, raise your hand, I want to be part of that. Uh, we got to figure out where, where folks want to participate, at what price, and, and all those things, and figure out what's going to work. Uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer as well, has anyone really looked at the economic impact of what this is going to be? Uh, I'm just playing with the numbers. What sure. we're holding and what we're looking at, uh, I mean, it's, it, it can be significant because we're real close to the creek. And Fitz, I mean, I, I'm just looking at me. I think we're into dry land farming and with no, we're going to have to take a hit. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think there's there's been a few different folks that kind of looked at it. And you know, have different different opinions. I, I won't. It, I will certainly not stand up here and say it's not going to be significant to you or anybody else, uh, or the area. I won't, I'm not going to say that uh, by any means. Um, but again, um, people say, "Well, what about that?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, the the law is pretty harsh on that standpoint. It's like it's it, it, we don't take economics into evaluation of the impairment or not, right? Because it's a property right. We've got to protect a property right and so while well, I can sympathize and try and help out with quantifying that, at the end of the day, uh, legally we're not really allowed to say we can't do that option. We can't take action because of the economics. Now we can try and, that's part of the reason for the work group and trying to, to try and find alternatives is to try, try and say, we know that, and, and again, we want to just go and start saying first in time, first in right, shut people off. That's going to be a really, that's probably the, the biggest economic impact there is across the board. And so we've already started to say, how do we, how do we, we can't eliminate the economic impact, but how do we try and minimize it as best we can? So, would you say that. all sides of this thing appreciate that at least? You know, that people want to school in St. John's still and, you know, buy the economic opportunities here? Well, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I, opinions will vary about what, what that means and, and how seriously they're going to take it, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, again, I'm not going to speak of, for, for somebody else, but they've got, if they've got a, a property right they got to protect, then how do you balance that versus everything else? Um, and so, you know, I, I think if, if this was a really clear cut issue and there wasn't an economic issue, then we wouldn't be sitting here today, right? We would have, we would have taken action under a water administration and this would have been done a long time ago. I think everybody, at, at the state level and at the federal level, from what I've heard, again, I'm not talking about what I've heard, everybody understands that is trying to be, you know, trying to be as sensitive to it as you can while trying to do your job and make sure you're, if you got the senior right, how do you protect that right and and, and do the job that they got to do too. It, it's, there's no easy balance here. So. Yeah, Barry. Earl, you talked about looking at pilot projects, and I'd like to get you to address the same thing. Uh, one, what do you envision a pilot project looking at like today? And two, at the GMD meeting a couple weeks ago, Warren said they looked at a partial implementation or something, that they got a ruling that that would preclude uh, them from getting any funding down the road because they started the project. Did you address 
how you would suggest a cost project without costing funding? Well, I don't, you know, I think it is, it is going to cost funding, right? I mean, well, I meant to prohibit that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I look at it from the standpoint of, um, you know, looking at wells that are, are close to the creek and as close to the refuge as, as you can get, right? And, and maybe you lease those and turn that pump around and, and pipe water into the, you know, the creek at the time we need it rather than irrigate it, right? Um, so I think that's how you do a pilot with, at, again, it's not cheap, but as, as cheaply as you can in the meantime. I think that that does, I think that helps demonstrate to, to all of you and the rest of the public of what that would look like in a bigger scheme, right? Where you have a dedicated well field maybe, or, or maybe you take some of these and permanently change it around, whatever. Um, but, but I think that is helpful and it helps us evaluate the effectiveness of that as well. And I, and I think, frankly, the conversation we've had with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I think that is also a, a show of good faith that people are serious about getting wet water in the street, right? Um, a lot of the other actions, whether it's administration or buying water rights, you know, there, there is a benefit, and it's going to be a benefit long term, but, you know, that benefit may materialize two years or five years down the line. Um, and, and so how do we try and bridge that gap? Uh, now, I think the other piece, going back to the GMD meeting, I think they're in a little bit of a, a strange spot, right? Because um, you're in this EIS process, and the EIS process is about evaluating uh, different alternatives to solve a problem, right, or to achieve a goal. And uh, from a federal perspective, and again, I don't want to speak for federal agencies, you don't want to prejudge and start implementing your solution before there's been a determination by the federal agency that that's the right solution. Right. So that's kind of the time gap we're in. Now, you know, I think there's a little bit of, you know, what's the role of the GMD? Because really, you know, we're a cooperating agency on the EIS, but we're not the we're not the holders of the or, or the conductors of the EIS. That's really GMD five uh, in combination with NRCS, and then even U.S. Fish and Wildlife is in the case of a cooperating agency. And so, you know, is there a way for us as a cooperating agency? Uh, or property agencies to try and move forward with something kind of in parallel with GMB5, but where they're not necessarily the, the sponsor of it. So I think there's there's ways we can probably toe up to that line without tripping over it, hopefully. Uh, but I, I do think there's some benefit to it as well, gaining some data that we can use to to uh, help define or design a, a, an ultimate well field. Other You're going back to the 50s and the 50s were wet, and boys were catching fish in the ditches. And so I know that it had to be different then for the groundwater as, as it is now. It was an entirely different period. Correct, right. And so, you know, we talk about the 50s because that's what the priority date of their water right is, right? But it doesn't necessarily lock us into that situation, right? We're not necessarily, I appreciate you saying that because it makes me come back around to the point of, we're not trying to get back to a 1957 situation, right? We're not trying to go, if we do that, we'd say all these 1400 wells are off forever and that's the way it is. Uh, we're going to get back to the 50, that's not what we're trying to accomplish, right? But that's what you're going back to. Well, that's, that's the point in time that we say, oh, is somebody junior to it? Is somebody potentially legally impacting them or not, right? But there is, you know, there was, there was certainly some water that could have and was developed, some usage, that is still means that their water right could be fully utilized. That Goose Fish and Wildlife's 1957 water right could be utilized because there was more water in the creek in the 50s than that was needed for the refuge. And so there was some, and has been, some development um, that could be after that 57 time period. That's, the, that's the, the determination we're trying to make is how much that water can those post-57 users use and still satisfy that senior right? right? That's, that's ultimately the legal question that we're trying to, to wrestle with and trying to solve. But we're not, we're not trying to, to make sure that they have water in every single situation because we recognize that you get into the, the depths of the drought, there's not enough water for everybody no matter what we do. Uh, and we're not trying to get back to a 50s situation because that means we, you know, every, all 1,400 water rights would be off. And, and that's... That, frankly, that's illegal too because the Appropriation Act says we have to put water to beneficial use as long as it's available. And so there, there was there was and is water available after the 57 water right for Quibera. We're legally responsible to try and help you put that to use for beneficial purposes. 
but it's, it's always that balance of how much can we do that and, and maintain the integrity of that senior right. I have a question. Yeah. Well, on your first slide, stated that fish and wildlife wanted 22,000 feet. And you said Pope reduced it to about 15,000. Has anybody revisited his work? Maybe it could go lower. No. Why? Uh, because I would say, because this is going to come up a lot, right? I'm sure somebody's going to challenge us on this, right? Uh, but there were pretty much, if, if your water right was certified in the 80s, 70s, 80s, early 90s, you are probably using copper levels of data, of data right? Um, and so that's something that we're probably going to talk about here later today. Um, if, if we create a situation where we go back, go back up one step here. When we, when we certify that, that is that is the, that is your property right, right? That is not how much necessarily you you need today. It is how much your how much that water you are entitled to legally. That is the amount you developed. And so again, that's a, an important component here is the state doesn't get out water rights. If you if you if this area was open and you applied today, you wouldn't apply to get a water right from us. You would apply to get a permit to develop a water right. Because by law, water rights are established through usage. And so there's a, a period of time that we look at and say, how much was, how much did you need for your project, whether that's irrigation or whatever. Um, and we look at that and say, what was the maximum amount of water you put to use during that period? And that becomes your, your record, right? And that becomes your, how much water you were entitled to. So to go back and say, should we revisit that? That means, you know, you, that would be a question of taking at that point, in my opinion. Now you're going back and saying, I know they have 14,000 acre feet, but we think they only should get 10 now, right? Now you're, now you're reducing their water, right? And so if yours was 200, and we came back and said, you know what, I think you only need 100. We're going to permanently reduce your water right by, some, by, by order. I think you don't argue for taking. Now, if we're saying we're only allocated that much because we've got to make sure that the senior right is satisfied, your water right hasn't, overall authorized authority hasn't changed, but your ability to access the water is being identified. So um, when people start talking about, let's go back and, and challenge it and change that water right, um, that makes me nervous on a couple of levels. One is, is starting to challenge individual people's property rights. And then the other is just the potential workload it creates because there are literally thousands of water rights that were perfected and certified on similar levels of data. And so we have to go back and say, we're going to go back and revisit every single one of those and figure out what we did right and did wrong. Um, and I don't know how we would do that. It would be fair. Now, the refuge there, right, was perfected in the 70s? <laughs> uh, the year of record was 1987. Okay. Right. And again, I know it's one thing like, well, that's a long time, and it is. Um, but there were a number of other water rights that were uh, had extended periods. Again, partially because if you think about the you know the amount of data we have today and the record keeping we have today for the audience reports and all those things is tremendous. But back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, again, many of you know this. Uh, there was not really good records on what was used, and so um, there was a lot of times that people were extended until we had good records. So that, that was a pretty common practice at the time. Yeah? So when we were in the room last time, we talked about the uh, refuge and maybe their lack of really good metering. Have you, uh, have you thrown something at them? Because if I blow a little water on the road, you uh, send me a nasty letter. So are they, are they metering their, their water actively now, correctly? Yeah, we... They are meeting their water actively, and we believe, and, and we have looked at it and approved it. We, we believe that it's the, the, the best metering that can be done uh, is what they have. And it's all going to beneficial use and not running down the ditches and the refuge? Well, that depends on what, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't know if ducks on the ditches were the same as ducks in their pools. Well, and their, their place of use is within the, was, is within Corvair, right? And so it's recreational use, and so the, the fish and wildlife, on the on the on the refuge certainly counts as recreational use. Now, I mean, some folks who debate that and say that's not really good, not beneficial use, but you know, that's another one that's been established for a long time and going back and changing that how it would be problematic. I'll give you the option. You've been up there for an hour and fifteen minutes. You want to keep going, or you want to? I'll, I'll keep going as long as folks to keep poking. Not, okay, 
Yep. Uh, so I happen to live in another basin uh, where, where the meniscal is potentially going to be impacted from your, your well field. How do you uh, foresee the impacts of Wichita might see? Because they've spent a tremendous amount of money protecting the meniscal off each Cheney Lake. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm glad, actually, I'm glad you have, I'm glad you stuck around because I, I should have come back to that question. Um, so at, at some point, I mentioned that we wanted to take some of the, the funding that's been allocated to visual water resources and make sure we're, we're prepared for the permitting. That, that's part of it, right? Um, is looking at those impacts not only to the and beyond Wichita, right? There's an observable stream flow in the Minnesota that we administer uh, pretty regularly. Um, and there's other senior rights besides Wichita uh, as well. So uh, we don't want to look at the impacts on the Minnesota. We want to make sure that we don't cause a problem on the rattlesnake, we don't solve the problem by creating a problem. And then of course we know that there's other folks that have house wells or pasture wells or something that, that once they start seeing um, you know a plan for a well filled area, they're gonna come and say, hey, what about what about us? And so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to kind of switch hats a little bit at that point and and not look at necessarily either the the impairment administration or trying to help lead a work group to find alternative solutions. But we're going to have to look at the permit and, and do that our other part of the job, make sure that we're not permitting something that's going to create another impairment. Uh, so that, that is going to be something we're going to have to take very seriously with that point of, of looking at all those other users and those other users, like say in the Nineveh or somewhere else downstream, and make sure that we're not creating a problem. So that's that's another big job we've got coming. Yeah. All right. Is that the last one? All right, thanks everybody, I appreciate the opportunity.